back with more innovation thinking processes and today we're going to talk about brainstorming methodology and you've likely done brainstorming before but you may have not got a deliberate thought process behind how you're brainstorming and why you're brainstorming and if you're doing brainstorming as a group activity as many of you may do in the future as product development managers or R&D leaders you will want to have a deliberate strategy behind how you do brainstorming. So we're going to do that today. At the end of this video, you will be able to apply Osborne's premises of brainstorming. You will reflect on good brainstorming tactics. You will discuss a variety of methods used in food product development brainstorming, understand the role of facilitation in brainstorming, and a apply a strategy to overcome barriers in good brainstorming practices. So. Brainstorming was invented by Alex Fakney Osborne, and this is a quote from him. Creativity is more than mere imagination. It is imagination inseparably coupled with both intent and effort. And Osborne was an advertising executive, originally based out of Buffalo, New York, so our neighbor for those of you who are Niagara people. And um, he was in the situation of running an advertising firm out of Buffalo, during the Great Depression in the 1930s, and his firm nearly collapsed, except that he uh, was able to secure a major account, relocated his practice to New York, New York City, and from there he took a much more deliberate strategy with how he was doing creative thinking, and from there developed a consulting firm that focused just on teaching and consulting with respect to helping people think creatively. As you can guess, in advertising and marketing, you have to be really very creative. Product development is often linked with advertising and marketing, and so that creative stimulus really needs to be in place. He was the one who came up with brainstorming and wrote about it extensively in his career. The main principle of brainstorming is that you're going to generate a lot of ideas towards a very specific and defined goal. You don't just walk in there and go, let's just think about stuff. You have a very specific goal. Today we want to find a new product for serving middle-aged women with teenage children. Something something like that, based off of the unit operations within our facility. Or what are some of the pain points that our customer base has and how can our products help relieve those pain points? It's really about a defined goal, not just walking in there with random randomness in play. That said, you do want to have some randomness. You want it to be spontaneous. You want it to be improvised. You want it to be free-flowing. You want to make sure that whenever you're doing brainstorming that you're not applying a lot of these metrics of feasibility. So um, DFVI matrices or SWOT matrices or um, meaningful uniqueness uh, metrics. You want to go into brainstorming and not apply those metrics on the front end. I know we spend a lot of time... Um, talking about that and often uh, I talk about the importance between um, being deliberate about your divergent versus convergent thought process well in this case in brainstorming you want to be focused on that very divergent with no convergence activities at all you will do that stage gating at a later point but brainstorming is just about generating lots and lots of content for the purposes of later on filtering through it, but not during the actual brainstorming process. So two key features in brainstorming that Osborne wrote extensively about is that it's really critical to defer judgment. You do not walk into a brainstorming session and go, oh, your idea is bad, that's a dumb idea, or even using, uh, those, those are very opinion-oriented statements, even saying, the facts don't back us up, you can't do this, you can't do that because of science, because of uh, public opinion, etc. Um, you defer that judgment for a later point. You need to be in a space that is avoiding those sorts of judgments or those sorts of um, opinions that would um, impact on someone's ability to think freely. The whole purpose of brainstorming is really about developing a large quantity of concepts 
based off of the theme that you're working under and not apply those judgments, not apply those feasibility matrices until a later point. You want people to be in a space where they're accepted and they're able to think about really wacky ideas without being a constraint. And that freedom from constraint is where people can go into a lot of really um, boundary pushing. And in many cases, that boundary pushing is where some of the best innovations occur. Now, good brainstorming does include quantity over quality. And so in many cases, people will go into brainstorming and just throw out all sorts of ridiculousness. Now, in some cases, it is ridiculous. And in other cases, uh, being really off the wall and um, uninhibited um, allows for people to uh, have a much more broad innovation mindset. I've stated this in the last slide, but there's no criticism involved in brainstorming. You have to be really careful to not go out and apply judgments to one another's statements. It's about that free flow of uh, massive generation. Wild ideas are very good in brainstorming. Again, we're not applying those um, convergent matrices until a later point. And what's really neat about brainstorming, um, one of the statements that's commonly stated one plus one equals three. In the case of brainstorming, you can combine ideas to improve them and use them as catalysts within the brainstorming activity itself. I love doing brainstorming activities and I've done it on behalf of a wide variety of different research clients, both as course-based and as um, functional research projects for the Canadian Food and Wine Institute Innovation Centre. This happens to be one of my favourites and this was uh, several years ago and we know that they speak about it um, in a lot of different media, but we worked with a major multinational um, bake company who wanted to connect better with um, millennials. And so we have here our millennial um, borderline Gen Z audience. They wanted to understand why was this classic cake company not really connecting and using some of their new ingredients that they had come out with that were clean label and um, better for you ingredients. We wanted to develop some new concepts that really resonated with the younger audience. So we collected a bunch of innovation students who happened to be that younger audience while also being skilled product developers. And we created these worksheets and everyone had the chance to play around with the ingredients at the front center station. And then um, using a tick box down the side, they would tick off, here are the ingredients that I've used. They, we had all sorts of coloring, and so you can see some of the different drawings that people made. They had to give uh, some sort of basic statement about what their product was and give a conceptualization of that product. It was a lot of fun, and we had several hundred different concepts developed for different cakes and desserts that could have been made from the base ingredients that were provided by the industry client. From there, we did a secondary prioritization exercise, and that's where the convergent aspect happened. But we did that on a completely different day. On this day, where we I call it the wall of cake day, on this day specifically, we just wanted people to go out and have a ton of fun and really imagine what they could do with the cake ingredients that we were provided by the client. Later, we did prioritize them and people went along and said, this is a cake that I would actually buy. And we, uh, how we did that prioritization, just to give some context, we gave everyone a set of 10 stickers and they could go and look at that wall and imagine they were shopping at the cake store and put their stickers on the cakes that they felt that they would have interest in buying. And from there, we were able to make a top list of the cakes that we thought had the most um interest and potential. We also did a feasibility assessment where a group of bakers, myself included, we went through and said, what would a in-store bakery be able to execute with the typical unit operations they had? And from there, we made a lookbook. We styled those cakes and uh, had them photographed and we made the instructions into an actual um, operating procedure for an in-store bakery to execute. Another one that we did, we were working with um, the Nourish group that is with the McConnell Foundation. And we were doing a brainstorming activity about how do we get fruit 
into the diets of people who are in institutional settings like hospitals, long-term care facilities, and so on. And we did a whole brainstorming about what are the pain points behind um, accessing Ontario fruit products in institutions. And so we, in this case, I did a facilitated exercise and uh, the group was just in a free form conversation and I was gathering all the different pain point ideas so that we could emerge with a better map where would be the appropriate strategies to be focusing when working on finding uh, suppliers or co-packers of uh, fruit-based products. Here's another one where we did, uh, we were doing some product development ideation and everyone was given a stack of post-it notes and was told, write as many ideas, one idea per post-it note as fast as possible. And then as they were um, writing ideas, I was up at the front of the room clustering the ideas into similar themes to see how they uh, generated out. And then we did a prioritization exercise where people said, here are some ideas that I think are worthwhile to move forward. And we took those into the product development class. So in general, uh, there's a bit of a flowchart. Uh, I'll admit I uh, borrowed this graphic from Wikipedia under Creative Commons. I, I do publish all of my YouTube videos under Creative Commons. Um, so in general, when doing a uh, brainstorming activity, you do a little bit of a warm up and you explain that problem and then you present what the rules of engagement are. So in general, you should restate Osborne's premises that it's going to be a space free from judgment. We do not criticize one another and we generate lots and lots of content as fast as possible. We call it for those ideas and people write their ideas down or a facilitator will write those ideas down. In some cases, it will just be a free flow and let people uh, engage, depending on the scenario. In other cases, you might do a facilitation where you go along and say, you over there in the corner, please give an idea. And you go summarily around the room to make sure that everyone has the chance to express their idea. Different premises. Um, the main thing is, in that scenario, you want to make sure that people don't feel under pressure. And if if they are in a space where they're like, I don't have an idea, you just go on and say, you know what, that's okay. We'll come back to you at a later point in time. There's going to be some sort of presenting ideas and recording of those ideas. And then if need be, there's a chance to elaborate and extend those ideas out. But um, in general, it's all about just generate lots and lots and lots of different ideas. There are a variety of different activities and tactics. Sometimes you can structure it so that you are doing... Um, clustering of like ideas. In other cases, you'll do facilitation where one person will start an idea and then another person will elaborate and elaborate sort of like the Kialo board that we're doing right now in another part of this class, where you, you put out one statement and people will put their arguments and other people can keep elaborating on that same string of arguments. Um, I've seen it where people do it sort of like a storyboard where one person starts a, uh, starts with their idea and everyone has their own page. You start with your idea and then you pass it to the next person who reads that idea and then they add their comments. And you keep passing those papers around the room every couple of minutes. And then eventually your paper comes back to you and you see all the different free flowing comments from everyone. There's lots of different ways to brainstorm. You can brainstorm brainstorming ideas. Now, there are some challenges behind brainstorming. Um, in some cases, uh, there is blocking where people will go in and have different attitudes or personalities that prevent good brainstorming. I did one facilitation um, for a, uh, it was it was about institutional change within a uh, college and university setting. And I was doing this facilitation and it just happened that the, the, the president of the college was in the room and that really impacted on the ability of people to speak freely at that time. However, it was really challenging because um, he wanted to be there and he was highly invested in the entire process and other people were feeling intimidated to speak openly while he was in that space. And I had to keep encouraging them to uh, feel free and know that he was very supportive of the whole endeavor. At the same time too, I had to on a few occasions, just gently take him aside and say, wait a second, 
your opinion is one of many in this space. And in the end, we will have some um, prioritization. But right now, we need to hear the voices of everyone in this room. And so you can't go out there and tell people that they're right or wrong. Sometimes people have challenges collaborating um, and they get fixated on different aspects of this. Um, evaluation apprehension. This is very common when doing um, brainstorming in classroom settings where people feel, well, if I don't do this well, I'm going to fail this activity. And so, or, or you'll see this in corporate groups where R&D teams are doing brainstorming and you might just have an off day. Maybe, maybe something else is distracting you and you walk into that brainstorming session and suddenly you don't have good ideas and you feel like that's going to impact on your performance review or your ability to get a bonus at a later point in time. Evaluation apprehension just uh, goes back to the fact that brainstorming needs to be done in a space that's free of judgment. And oftentimes, um, especially when it's being done in a classroom setting, you want to not have it linked out to specific outcomes. So if, if you say to a student, please brainstorm for me 10 ideas, you can't force it within the time frame of that exercise. Um, what else? Free writing. In some cases, um, free writing is, is challenging for people where um, the format, depending on language barriers, can be uh, difficult. And so if you're working in multicultural environments, um, but then having writing as part of the expectation, that can be really, really challenging. Personality characteristics and social matching can also be really, really difficult. Um, if you've got some introverts in the group and extroverts within the group, you can have people just dominating the entire conversation. And so you need to be, as a facilitator, making sure that you are providing mechanisms for people who are um, quieter in that group to have the chance to express themselves. Social matching, that's also uh, where I was mentioning about the president of the college in a brainstorming session. Um, it's difficult if you have uh, hierarchies within the room doing that brainstorming, unless you have a really, really tight team um, that within hierarchies, people can feel intimidated to participate. Here's some different brainstorming photos. Actually, that is the brainstorming activity that I was talking about um, with the president. That's that's him right there. <laughs> um, all sorts of different opportunities for brainstorming and I want to encourage people to try it out and in the end the more you do a skill and the more you practice it the more fun you'll have with it. I think a, this is a photo of uh, someone measuring out cut squash but I, I remember doing a brainstorming activity um, while teaching a product development course and I and I said to the team let's let's do a quick free thinking exercise and we'll have teams Everyone had a big flip chart in the middle of their table with their teams. And I said, I've got a flip chart at the front of the room. And I said, uh, sweet potatoes, everyone think about sweet potatoes. And in the next two minutes, just as fast as you can, write as many different things you can make with sweet potatoes. Go. And I'm up there scribbling on my chart and these other teams are, are scribbling. And I do brainstorming for product development all the time and I don't want to sound like I'm comparing or uh, pulling one of those rank issues with you but um, in my chart I think I had 40 things and the next group had like six. Practice it and honestly the more you just go out and challenge yourself to do these sorts of activities the better you'll become and also just try facilitating some brainstorming activities. I wish that we would be in class together because I like to teach it where different people lead brainstorming activities and have the chance to do that facilitation. Just practice it, have fun, and keep asking good questions. I always love to hear from you, and take care. We'll talk soon.